do so quietly, please. Thank you. The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14110 in the name of Paul Martin on reviewing arrangements for managing sex offenders. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Paul Martin to open the debate. Seven minutes please or so, Mr Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I say uh, first of all, President Officer, I recognise that the issue and discussing the issue of management of sex offenders is a difficult subject. It's one that challenges many politicians uh, across many countries. But can I, whilst we consider that, consider how Margaret Ann Cummings feels uh, when she debates this issue of how we manage registered sex offenders. Her son was murdered <coughs> at eight years of age uh, and he was murdered by registered sex offender Stuart Leggett. Margaret Ann Cummings is in the public gallery today uh, and I think I uh, hope others would join with me in commending her good work, uh, tireless work over the years in protecting children and also her determination uh, to ensure that communities are protected and indeed ensuring that history doesn't uh, repeat itself and she's to be commended uh, for that good work along with the Housing Association uh, movement who many of them are represented here today. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, the Justice 2 subcommittee published its 33 uh, recommendations to manage registered sex offenders in Scotland. And ten years on from the publication of the subcommittee, there remains a number of recommendations that have to be taken forward. The government would advise us today that there has been progress, but there remains a number of them that have to be taken forward. But one in particular hasn't been taken forward, and that's number 20 that's still not been implemented, and that's recommendation that there be a legal requirement for sex offenders to disclose information about previous convictions and housing applications. Now, I pursued this with various justice ministers over uh, the 10 years, and I have to say that there remains a number of challenges. And I work closely with the Housing Association movement and key figures from uh, those community organisations who have expressed their great concern about the existing arrangements that are in place and particularly the lack of progress in that particular recommendation. And, President Officer, you can understand their concerns. As we speak, young families have been, have been housed in close proximity to dangerous sex offenders without them being aware of that, and I find that unacceptable. And this, of course, is a particular concern because disproportionately deprived communities find themselves being de de dumped on by uh, the allocation policy in that respect. And I believe it's only a matter of time. If we don't take action, then tragedy will strike again, such as what happened in the case of Mark Cummings. The President Officer, I recognise that there has been some progress. Uh, we've seen the introduction of Sarah's Law, which allows parents to make inquiries uh, in respect of anyone that they have close contact with who they believe there may be a history of sexual offences. I recognise that there's been significant moves forward with Clare's Law when it was introduced earlier this year, which allows people to find out whether their partner has a history of domestic violence. I recognise the progress that has been made in those areas. But I do pose the question, President Officer, if we use the internet to keep men and women safe from violent partners, then why can't we use it to protect our children? I think it's time for the Parliament to consider a compulsory community notification, such as the one that we see in other parts of the world, including uh, in the USA and Australia and South Korea. In the US, each of the 50 states has implemented a different form of compulsory notification, known as Megan's Law, uh, by providing information about dangerous child sex offenders on an internet da database. In Vermont, it is, it is internationally recognised has been one of the most effective programmes in managing registered sex offenders. And re an absolutely crucial element to the programme that they've brought forward in that state is the distinction between low-risk and high-risk offenders, something that we fail to do dramatically uh, in Scotland and other parts of the world. It is also, also recognised at the same time that it's well managed and properly resourced to ensure its effectiveness. Now, I do recognise, President Officer, and I think many of us do recognise that the, such information being provided publicly can be a concern. Uh, and I do recognise many of the points that are made in that respect. But can I make the point 
at that. If we have to give communities proper empowerment, then it's something that we have to take forward. And I do recognise that people feel it's a step uh, too far, but as long as we take reasonable steps to protect information and ensure that those who are searching the information are properly vetted whilst they carry out that particular search. Officer, I also think we should review the sentencing tariffs that are available to us to deal with particularly child sex offenders. And I also think it's time to take forward the sophisticated technology that we have discussed on many occasions in this chamber over the last 10 years, the GPS tracking. I don't know many occasions in this chamber we have discussed how we can take that forward. And I find it unacceptable that in the run-up to 2016, almost 10 years on, we still discuss the formation of a working group and the work and how that can be taken forward. And I would like the Minister to, to advise us today how he would wish to take that forward. President Officer, can I say, uh, in conclusion, can I, and I, can I quote Colin Barnett, the Premier of Western Australia, where he said, this government has made it very clear that they will err on the side of those who are the victim, the, ch the children, and protecting their child. I call on the government to make a very similar statement. As I know, sir, I ask the government to support the motion in my name. Any thanks? We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Christine Graham to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too congratulate Paul on securing this debate and recognise also the courageous campaign of Marg Ann Cummings, which came about, as he said, after the horrendous murder of her son. I have corresponded with Mrs Cummings and regret I will be unable to meet her after this debate due to policing the, uh, chairing the policing committee immediately afterwards. But I, I certainly hope um, she sees that I really feel and understand why she has been in these circumstances and campaign. Um, can I also recognise with Paul Martin the complexity of this area, if only we could sort it all out. I've looked at the recent report of the Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and the Care Inspector did a joint report on what we call MAPA, the multi-agency uh, protection, which is set in place when sex offenders are finished, their sentence released into communities. And I do note their main findings, there's strong evidence that it's well established and working across communities. But I have had my own issues in my constituency, which the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister are well aware of. It's issues with the operation of the National Accommodation Strategy for Sex Offenders. And of course, key to this is where do these people go? Not just how they monitor, but where they're placed. Um, the circumstances, and these are very special, where they, they must be placed and returned to the, the place where they were first resident, where they were last resident when the offence took place. Now, there are circumstances, and there are very special ones, whereby the offender and MAPA, with negotiation with other local authorities, can be rehoused elsewhere. But I've been unable to determine how often this has been invoked. So key to the, the thing is management of these offenders. I come to whether or not they should be out or not, but key is management of these offenders, where they are, and the authorities knowing where they are and where necessary, tagging their every movement. This issue arose for me when convicted rapist Robert Greens was released after serving six years and eight months of a 10-year sentence for the horrendous attack and rape of a young student from the Netherlands who had gone to visit Rosalind Chapel. When released, he was rehoused in a rural cottage on the outskirts of Newton Grange and Gorebridge in my constituency, just a few miles from the scene of the attack. Because of those Nassau rules, as I've said, he had to be rehoused in Midlothian. No other authority UK-wide would rehouse him. Almost predictably and understandably, hundreds turned out to protest gathering outside the cottage. I can understand that matter. And it only became resolved when he breached the restrictions under his registered sex offenders order and was seen in Pennycook, where he wasn't supposed to go. And that took him back to prison. But he is due for release next year and the community will be back where it started. Now, I accept, as it says in this joint report, it should be stressed that while the fundamental purpose of MAPA is to protect the public, and the work of responsible authorities cannot entirely eradicate risk. But I still have issues with resolving the rehousing issues, which will be required when someone's released. 
I would think there's a very small number of instances where we have serious sex offenders where the issues that Paul Martin has raised when they repeat happen, but they happen. These are very serious people. And although they're small in number, we cannot allow them to happen again. So I've got issues with the housing and the system of which we rehouse. But I've also got another issue which Paul Martin touched on. And that is this question, while not interfering with judicial independence, I too am concerned that some people are released back into the community when they should never be released at all. It's not very often, but once is just once too often. So I know we've got the Cabinet Secretary for Justice here, I've got the Minister for Housing. I know these are difficult issues. I know if they could resolve the issues about the housing, certainly about sentencing is another thing, they would do so. But I ask them to look again at it because the issues that Paul had worse than mine are also repeated to some extent in my own constituency. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I too congratulate my colleague Paul Martin on his long-standing commitment and campaigning on this issue. And of course, to Margaret Ann Cumming, who has courageously spent the 11 years since her personal tragedy, trying to ensure that no one has to suffer in the way that she has. And Paul Martin is right too to identify the sterling work done and being done by our local housing associations. If this parliament is about anything, it must be about pr protecting those who are most vulnerable in society. And in this context, clearly, that's our children. The report produced by the Parliament's Justice Committee in 2006 made 33 recommendations and was seen as a major contribution at that time to the debate. The fact that some of those recommendations, and in particular recommendation 20, which concerns housing applications, has not yet been implemented, is in my view very regrettable. But that report is now 10 years old, and perhaps it's time to have a fresh look at the entire subject and issue. But I want to look in a wee bit more detail about housing and a particular aspect of housing that happens to be particularly dear to my heart from my own experience. Um, most sex offenders, when they're released from prison, will avail themselves of social rented housing by the very nature of the individuals and their circumstances. And housing providers are rarely aware of this aspect of an applicant's background. So people will be housed where there is available accommodation. And in my constituency and constituencies like mine, that might well be in a high-rise block. Now, living in a high-rise block is very different from living in any other kind of accommodation. You, in effect, have an entire street with one entrance. So, on a daily basis, you, you can't cross the road to avoid someone you don't want to talk to. You will be likely to have to travel for a period of time, perhaps alone, in a very confined space, every time you want to go into and leave your home. You also have the added complication of stairwells and of fire exits, which are not often used because people will obviously want to take the lift whenever they can. So these are all areas in which people become particularly vulnerable. And for parents with children, it is often very, very hard because they let their children go to school in the morning, for example, and once the child goes out the door, they don't know what's happened to that child or where they are. So it seems to me that the particular situation that arises because of uh, the particular circumstances of high-rise flats should be particularly taken into consideration because even for parents putting their children out to play, they often um, cannot see where their children are and they have very little oversight. It does suggest to me, I have to say, that uh, families should not be accommodated in high-rise blocks, but perhaps that's an argument for another day. But I certainly think we should be looking very seriously at the issue that is confronting us when we have sex offenders in the community and they may well be accommodated in a high-rise block. And Christine Graham is absolutely right to say that this is a very, very complex issue, the rehousing and resettlement of particular offenders. 
But we must surely redouble our efforts to find solutions so that no case uh, can be seen to have fallen through any loophole that we have allowed to continue to exist. There are international examples of good practice that we can call upon and we can look at. And I'm sure that the, the present government is doing that and is bringing every opportunity it has uh, to bear on this. But I really do think the time has come for us to review what's happened in the past, to look at those international examples and to do everything in our power to make sure that children in this country are protected to the very limit of our ability to do so. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Graham Pearson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank Paul Martin for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. This is a motion I was more than happy to sign, not least because it gives deserved recognition to the courage and tenacity of Margaret Ann Cummings in campaigning to ensure that sex offenders are managed in a way that poses the least possible risk to our communities. There is little doubt that the tragic murder of Mark Cummings served as a wake-up call to the Scottish Parliament that more can and must be done to keep our communities safe from serious sex offenders. It was with this in mind that the Justice Subcommittee was established in 2006 to review these dangerous and devious individuals. Following on from the review, 33 recommend recommendations were made intended to protect children. Nearly all of these have been implemented. However, I do consider it totally unacceptable that almost 10 years later, the vitally important one, calling for sex offenders to disclose information about previous convictions on housing applications still hasn't been implemented. This is a situation which must be addressed now. The motion also refers to the need for the risks posed by serious sex offenders in communities across Scotland to be examined. And a good starting point would be the Scottish Government's annual report published in October this year on MAPA, which stands for the Multi multi-agency public protection arrangements in Scotland. The MAPA guidance states that the primary purpose of sex offender notification requirements is to establish the police to know, is to enable the police to know the location of sex offenders and to manage these sex offenders and minimise the, the risks of further offending against the public. Yet this report reveals in the last year a staggering 331 registered sex offenders failed to comply with this notification and to let the police know whether their whereabouts or their current situation. Furthermore, this represents an increase of a third compared to the year before. Which brings me to the Scottish... Uh, clearly, obviously, this is, a, an, uh, this is a situation which requires urgent analysis. Right. Cabinet I... Secretary. Comment to the fact that there had been a third of an increase in breaches. Uh, that's factually incorrect. Uh, the proportion of breaches uh, year on year are broadly the same. What has happened is that the numbers of individuals who are on such orders has increased. But proportionately, the numbers that have breached them have not increased by a third. Margaret Mitchell, I give you your time back. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding. I thank the Minister for that clarification. It's still not a, a, a statistic that we can be proud of in any way, shape or form. So clearly an urgent analysis needs to be carried out to establish what's gone wrong here and to rectify this situation as a priority. Which brings me to the Scottish Conservative pro pro proposal to address and reduce this risk namely for sex offenders to lose their right to anonymity if they breach the notification requirements imposed under the terms of their release. Losing the right to anonymity in these circumstances is entirely justified to protect the public and to reduce risk, as well as aiding the police in their efforts to locate the individual. It would also serve as a powerful deterrent to any sex offenders who may be considered considering breaching the terms laid down on the sex offenders register. 
In conclusion, presiding officer, there is a balance to be struck between allowing someone who has served their sentence the freedom to integrate back into society and protecting the communities in which they are placed. And here it's evident from, evident from the MAPA report that ten, 10 years on from the Justice Subcommittee review on the management of serious sex offenders that much more requires to be done in an effort to ensure local communities are protected. At the very least, these communities have a right to expect that everything which can practically be done is being done to ensure that tragedies like Mark Cummings' murder will never be repeated in their neighbourhoods. Many thanks. And I now call Graham Pearson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, first of all, can I thank my colleague, Paul Martin, for raising this difficult and challenging issue. It's one that we uh, often uh, struggle with and they uh, repeatedly find uh, difficult to resolve. Uh, secondly, can I thank uh, Margaret Ann Cumming uh, for maintaining a very positive role in reflecting on behalf of all victims and survivors of crimes of, of sexual abuse and, and death uh, at the hands of uh, sex offenders and constantly reminding us in, in authority, this parliament, this government, of the need to co constantly revisit these uh, issues and acknowledge that we still haven't found a way to get it right. Uh, and it may well be the case that in, in this world, we will never get it absolutely right but that doesn't mean we, should, we shouldn't strive to repair the elements that we do identify as having shortcomings. A lot has been said about the MAPA environment, and there have been many positive comments in relation to the development of MAPA in, in the years. And I think, I certainly say on my own behalf, I don't see today's debate as a criticism of the government or a criticism of what's gone in, in the past. It's a contribution to see how best we can do it in the future. And I would acknowledge that although MAPA has been a step change for us, it, we rely too heavily on the notion that, that MAPA exists and therefore we should take some comfort from it when in actual fact we should continue to challenge what MAPA does on our behalf and also to realise that those officers and other services that contribute to the, the MAPA knowledge, that they balance many uh, stresses and anxieties as they try and manage probably too many demands with too few resources at their fingertips. Behind that too, I think that I, I would like to see acknowledged today that although we have an intelligence management system in Scotland, it's not as robust and as effective as it should be. And again, I would like to hear from the Cabinet Secretary that he will take a second look at the way IT systems operate across the public services to manage the very dangerous uh, circumstances that uh, repeated sex offenders present to all the services. Mention was men mentioned of the GPS tracking systems that are available. Uh, this system exists. It can be switched on by merely the flick of a switch now, I'm told, by those who manage the electronic surveillance of those uh, on remand and subject to supervision. And really, we need to face a challenge. Do we want to use GPS tracking? And if the answer is yes, then we need to get on with it sooner or later, and sooner rather than later. And if the answer is no, we need to work out what it is about the tracking system that uh, is not available to us now. I'm happy to give way. Cabinet Member, Secretary. Give way. Do, uh, if, uh, to, uh, just to clarify the point, because obviously Mr Martin raised the issue about establishing a working group. The expert advisory group has actually been in place for a number of months now, and its report is actually just weeks away, and the advice that they will give to ministers on the use of GPS the issue of GPS, there are some technical challenges around it in terms of it doesn't give the level of security that some individuals believe it does. So there are some challenges around how it can be properly used. But the expert advisory group have been looking at that internationally in order to identify how it can be best applied within a Scottish context. Graham Pearson, you can have the time back. 
Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. I'm grateful for that response. Uh, I can tell the Minister that having visited the monitoring centre itself, uh, the advice that I was given during the visit is that they are very confident that the ability of the GPS system to more effectively monitor uh, dangerous offenders, whether sex offenders or other offenders, uh, than is currently the situation uh, as we administer it now. Uh, so I would ask them to challenge those who are advising them and uh, let's get to the right answer in that regard. A couple of bullet points I would mention in time available. Offender management should begin in prison before release. And I think more attention needs to be paid uh, to dealing with offending in prison and to initiate those kinds of courses that can better uh, redirect uh, offenders onto a more useful lifestyle for the future and deal with the reoffending rates. Secondly, uh, I think it is important that housing associations should know the backgrounds to those sex offenders who are applying for tenancies. Um, the difficulty arises when there is a public knowledge of offenders within communities, and I know that Paul Martin's aware of the issues that lie behind uh, those challenges, the threat of vigilante action, offenders going underground, uh, encouraging offenders to create their own networks, etc. Uh, but I do think uh, housing associations should be aware of their responsibilities in managing applications, and they can't really accept those responsibilities unless they know the nature of those people that they offer houses to. The final bullet point I would mention is that uh, White Flowers Alba uh, are a group who did provide a briefing ahead of, of today's uh, debate and fully support the motion from Paul Martin. They also raise the fact that a broad remit in the public inquiry that's ongoing just now might give us more lessons to learn for the future and how we respond to sex offenders and how we manage that risk. I hope that the, man, the government will listen to what uh, White Flowers Alba have to say and try and encourage the best use of that public inquiry. Thank you. Many thanks. Can I now invite Margaret Burgess to respond to the debate? Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I thank Paul Martin for bringing this debate to the Chamber. He made it very clear, and I think we all agree it's a very sensitive issue and it's a very difficult issue uh, to deal with. And I know that, that Margaret Ann Cummings is in the gallery today, and, and like other members, I want to commend her in the work that she's been doing, uh, her and her supporters, to, to avoid any other child suffering uh, the fate of her son. And I completely understand uh, that why she's taking this action and why she's doing everything possible uh, to, to learn the lessons from Mark's death. And I want to give some reassurance that the government and responsible authorities are all working towards that shared goal. goal. And it's been mentioned by a number of speakers that the Joint Thematic Review of MAPA, which was published last week by the Care Inspector and Her Majesty's, Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. Um, and the report shows, as Christine Graham says, that there is strong evidence that MAPA is well established across Scotland, that professionals are working effectively on a day-to-day -day basis to protect communities. I'll give way. Paul Martin. Can I thank the Minister for giving way? Also in the report included that sex offenders could expect to receive a visit or a prospective part of a monitoring visit once a month. Uh, do you find that acceptable for the most serious offenders? Minister? What we're saying is we, we've received the report and we're going to take every recommendation in that report and look at it as well. We all agreed that we have to look. It's a very difficult issue and I understand the concerns that members have across the chamber. I share those concerns. I also get people coming to my surgeries uh, with these very uh, sensitive issues about uh, sex offenders and the monitoring of sex offenders. So we'll be looking very carefully at the the thematic report that's just been published. Uh, we will be taking out the, rec the 10 recommendations that the report uh, may makes to improve processes and reduce unnecessary bureaucracy. We've accepted all of these. We'll work with the police and other responsible authorities to take them forward. And in such a difficult subject, as I think we said, we can't ever, ever be complacent. I'll take Christine Graham. 
I mean, I've looked through the recommendations and I'm back to what I've been chasing for a while with yourself and other members is about housing under the, the rehousing of sex offenders under the National Accommodation Strategy for them. I know this is difficult, but I don't think I don't think it's sufficient, frankly, for to say, you know, it's working well. There are issues in high-rise flats. There are issues in small communities. There are issues in island communities. You know, I think we have to look at something that works better for the community, whether it's the issues raised by Patricia Ferguson or myself. And I would hope the Minister would look at this again, because I don't think this inspection report refers to that. Minister? I, I understand the... the concerns that Christine Graham has raised regarding the housing of sex offenders in community but with every single case in housing sex offenders into the community it is when assessing the suitability of accommodation for offenders it's about the safety of the community that's the absolute priority uh, in that is the safety of the community and it will be looked at the type of accommodation the high-rise flat in relationship to the the, the offence whether that's a suitable place to house somebody but I think it was said by I think Graham Pearson we have to be very careful that we don't push people underground here uh, we don't want to push people underground we need to know where the people are and we need to be able to monitor them and if members have suggestions I'm not say saying for a minute in terms of housing we won't look at them we will always look at suggestions in terms of how it can best serve communities and other people living in the area but priority will always be for the safety of the community so I, I, I want to just put, push on a bit and if I have time later I will come back to Patricia uh, Ferguson a number of uh, members have mentioned the, the Justice 2 committee report uh, on sex offending requiring housing applicants to declare their registered sex offenders but in 2014, the Justice Secretary uh, came to this chamber and explained that implementing the recommendation would not be compatible with the Scottish Parliament's duty to ensure that all legislation that it passes is compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights. But even if it were possible to implement that recommendation, there's still a risk of driving offenders underground, and I know everybody in this chamber doesn't want to do that. Making it I'll take it, I'll, I want to push on for a bit, then, then I'll come back to monitor and manage the risks. We need to be able to know where people are, monitor and manage the risks. And as I said to Christine Graham, if members have, uh, have raised concerns here today, these are not going to be ignored. We will look at that. We'll look again. We're looking at the thematic report, and then we'll have to look at how that works with some of the other things that are proceeding just now. I'll, I'll take the intervention. Joanne Lamont. Just to recognise the urgency of a situation where housing associations are saying communities are feeling that disproportionately sex offenders are being housed in, in deprived communities, vulnerable communities already. What representation, I see the Cabinet Secretary is no longer here, what representation has been made in the budget discussions with John Swinney around financing a proper monitoring programme? Because perhaps people would be less anxious about um, the monitoring programme, if we had any confidence it was actually being done, what resources are going in to make that real for people and give people protection? Minister? I think what, what I would say in terms of the budget, I, I can't respond for the Justice Secretary, but I know that across government we're looking very carefully at how sexual offenders are monitored. And when I come on a bit later, we'll talk about some of the things that we are doing which should help with the monitoring of sexual offenders. And, and um, the Justice Secretary said there what's happening in surveillance, the expert group, how it's reporting and looking at that, what can be done there. We have the Sentencing Council looking at cens sentencing tariffs as well, that that's another area that we can look at. But it is a difficult area, and I think everybody's recognised that, but we, we want to reduce the risks as far as possible. And we all have in our con uh, constituency experience the rehousing of sex offenders that are released into the community is a particularly fraught problem. But we have to reintegrate them into the community like other offenders on release from prison. And in common with other offenders, registered sex offenders will generally return to their own communities unless there are exceptional circumstances, which will mean this will increase the risk to the community. And, and that may cover the point that, that Christine Graham raised, but there are flexibilities within that where local authorities can work with another area and agree, but 
they have to take the responsibility for the sex offender, know where they are and follow the monitoring and the surveillance. The thematic inspection found that during a two-year period from the 1st of January 2013 to, to, to December 2014, 86% of sex offenders release, released returned to the same type of housing following imprisonment and 73% returned to the same or a neighbouring community. And where a sex offender is placed outside their own local authority area, it's to increase the safety of the community and not to protect the anonymity of the offender. So, you know, we, we would want to make that clear. It's at all times about the community and protecting the community. The Scottish Government will continue to take steps to make sure that Scotland has in place a strong legislative framework with robust monitoring arrangements with agencies working together and, and that certainly the Justice Secretary is looking at that. We're looking across government how we can all work together to make our communities safer in many different ways. I'm going to, to finish now by saying I know this has been an extremely difficult debate. Um, but I think it has been worthwhile. It's given members the opportunity to raise concerns. These are genuine concerns that are across this chamber in every party, including myself. myself. Um, we have listened. It is a dis distressing subject, but I hope that what we are illustrating is that we take this very seriously, that uh, Margaret Ann Cummings and her supporters, as well as members of the public, will recognise what we are doing, the strength of our arrangements for managing the risk posed by sex offenders, our commitment to making sure they work as effective, effectively as we can across the country, and that's in line with some of the other things that we're doing in terms of sentencing, surveillance, and overall in the justice, the sexual harm, um, civil action for sexual harm as well. So all of that together, I think, should give us some um, reassurance that we are doing everything we can but of course we're open to listening to ideas and suggestions if we can improve things we certainly will thank you thank you minister that concludes paul martin's debate reviewing arrangements for managing sex offenders and i now suspend this meeting of parliament until 2:30 p.m <laughs>